I, th I think hardship and trauma are always a good catalyst for someone doing something great, right? I felt very unemployable. I didn't feel like I was being respected as a human. And I think I'm very judicial. And so I have, I like to respect people and I expect to be respected back unless I've done something. And so for that reason, I knew entrepreneurship was my path. Even if I had to work 10 times as hard to barely make it by, I had to be my own boss. In today's social media obsessed world, we all see the successes, the world record breaking, and the achievements of the people we look up to. But what we don't see is what goes on behind the scene. Hosted by power couple Dean and Alana Stott, this show is dedicated to asking difficult questions while discovering the support systems and people behind those we love and respect in media, business, athletics, and high-performance culture. Dean and Alana believe that through honest communication, teamwork, and mutual respect, that anything is possible. Like, there's not a better partner I could choose who's equally as crazy as me because we have a chip on our shoulder to prove people wrong, you know? Uh, and to prove ourselves right. I can go be the face of this. I can go do this, but I don't understand the back end of this. I have to learn business. I have to learn how this works. Many couples in this dynamic are stuck and unable to move forward in an identity crisis. Marcus's energy is so bad. I feel like I need to cleanse my house. Like it is so it's suffocating. And then seeing him 24 hours later, he was as light as air. Yeah. And we literally, I, like, we literally embraced, hugged. I stepped back and I said, this is exactly what the guys need. When we can look behind the scene and learn from each other, we can finally move forward and transform into our fullest potential. Bedros, Dana, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Alana and I both been excited about this one. Bedros, I've just, just literally on the fly over finished finished man up <laughs> so that's, that was great diana i apologize i haven't had a chance to meet you in person but um when i return to usa hopefully we'll get we'll get together but Definitely. having now read man up having now met bedros a couple of times um i just think there's so many crossovers and synergies with what alana and i have been doing in business what you guys are doing in business you know there's been occasions looking at yours bedros it seems to be finding the right partners. And that, that seemed to be a bit of a hurdle. Um, mm -hmm. And I've done the same in the past. I've, I've said to Lana, I know this work, these guys have got, Gil's got the same interest as ours and she's corrected me so many times. And uh, yeah, I wish I'd listened to it from the start. And no doubt there's probably uh, similarities in, in your relationships as well. But um, so from my side, no, thank you so much for coming in. And I'll let Alana start off with probably getting Diana to introduce herself. Yeah, cool. So behind the scenes, just so if, you, if, you, if you're not familiar with the the, the concept of the show, um, we create the idea based on the amount of people that we've seen who is at the front of the scene. Everybody, everybody sees that person. They're the, they're the one that everybody sees. And what we started to do was ask questions about who was behind the scene. That was mm. really what we were, we were interested in because we were finding for every successful person, there was somebody else behind there kind sure. of running the, the yeah. cogs. So we we started that show with this with this concept. Obviously, but the, the partnership that we've got runs like that. So we really wanted to interview people who had that similar setup and just find out how it works. Really, mm -hmm. and that's where we got. So um, we want to know really where you guys met. That would probably be where mm -hmm. we would start. Mm. Um, well, that'd be a good story a for you to tell. That's a fun story. <laughs> yeah, that is. Yeah. You want me to tell it? Yeah, I think you say it. Tell it best. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. gosh, back in 2001, I was a college student and I got a job at a gym as the phone girl because I was still working towards my certification as a personal trainer. And Bedros was the assistant manager at this gym. Um, and it's a funny story because for the first, like, how many days was it? I think it may have been about two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Two okay. Weeks. So for the first two weeks that I'm working there and I'm just sitting there making phone calls, trying to get people to come in for sales appointments to, you know, new members of the gym coming in to become personal training clients. And 
Bedros is a very charismatic and friendly guy. And he was, you know, I feel like you kind of like ruled that gym. Like you were the assistant manager and you knew all the clients, you knew everybody there. And so he's like this friendly, outgoing guy. And I'm super quiet, like shy, introvert. I had just moved down to California. It's my second year of school, like totally out of my element. And he did not speak to me for two full weeks. He would talk to everybody else in the whole gym, all the other trainers, like everybody. And it's like, I was invisible for two full weeks, which really got my attention. Mm. <laughs> and then like, like a light switch after two weeks, he started talking to me and like, hey, you want to be a personal trainer? Let me uh, let me help you study for your test. Let me show you, um, you know, how to train clients. So maybe you can share why you didn't yeah, speak so to me for two weeks. <laughs> truth is, I, I had the what I consider the worst job of all <laughs> as the assistant manager. The manager of the place kind of delegated to me that if the person making these calls to turn members into appointments for personal trainers, if she can't hack it, because you know you deal with a lot of rejection over the phone, right? Hey, I'm already a member. I don't need a personal trainer to hang up on you. If she can't hack it, it's your job to fire her. And like, I didn't want to fire people. And so I found that if I don't know you, if there's no relationship, there's no friendship, it might be easier to fire you. So after two weeks, I went to my manager and I said, hey man, what, what do you think? Is, is she a keeper? He's like, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and then all of a sudden we're friends, we're working out together. Yeah. I, I, and she's obviously massively attractive. And the one thing she's not telling you is when she would work out at the gym, um, all these guys would try and talk to her, many of them personal trainers. And then they'd come up to me and go, man, she's a hard nut to crack. Like she won't talk to us. She won't, you know, won't, won't want to go on a date. And I'm like, well, so that one, there's intimidation factor. Two, I might have to fire her. So why bother talking to her? But then um, the relationship just just blossomed once we started working out together and working together. And she became an amazing personal trainer. And um, that, that kind of set our trajectory up mm -hmm. for the next 20 years to come. Yeah, in fitness. Yeah. So at this point, you were the assistant manager at this gym. <clears throat> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, had, did you have aspirations of, of building your own gym while you were there or? I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I had known ever since I had my first job at 13 years old that I was un, unemployable. <laughs> I've lost, I've been fired from every job okay. that I've had. <laughs> and so I, I knew it was gonna be a path to entrepreneurship. I didn't think it would be into owning a gym or in the fitness industry per se. Uh, I was passionate about fitness. In fact, my first attempt was software yeah. for the fitness industry. Uh, which massive failure. And, and you know, this now as an entrepreneur, like your first thing out the gate, it's rarely the one that's going to be a home run. And I so, feel like uh, we learned so much though. We did. We did. Cause we started that software company when we were still working at the gym uh -huh. and yeah. our investor and our two partners were clients that we had. Yeah. Um, it, it I mean, was, it was like a mishmash. It of was, like, it was, yeah. but it was all, and then we did a bunch of trade shows. Like it was just like, so that was your, so I'd love to hear that conversation. Did you both chat together about this software company? Was it? I guess I had the vision, yeah. but Diana was so good at taking my vision that was like this big 30,000 foot level idea of how I want it to look. And then she would break it down into digestible, edible pieces. Like now we need to do this. Now we need a male. Uh, so she was a female athlete and we did over a thousand uh, exercise, demonstration exercise videos, but then we needed a, a male one. So, okay, now, hey, go find a male one. So I'd go find a male athlete to do the pictures. Okay, now we need this, now we need, so it was, all I knew was here's how I wanted to look at the end. And then she would draw out the pieces and organize. And I, till this day, it's like, I'll, I'll be the controlled chaos. And then now Diana and the team <laughs> that she works with will organize things and make it digestible and, um, operative operatable if that's a word and and once we can do that then i'll just have to always live in the future like that's what's really cool she allows me to live in the future not necessarily in the trenches awesome yeah i feel like in the early years i was doing a lot of like the kind of like 
tedious but like important work. So like that software, we had thousands of exercises and we needed to write like actual scripts for how to perform the exercise. And I just remember like hours at Excel sheets, like writing the process of doing this exercise um, and, and stuff like I, I definitely have the attention span to yeah. sit there and do the tedious. I would poke my eyes, my our eyes thing. out <laughs> before I did that. So it was just such a perfect combination where, you know, she's doing the detail work. I'm doing the visionary stuff. Um, and then finding the investors and the business partners and Dean, as you said, like, you know, like most of your business partners aren't going to work out. They don't share the same vision. They don't have the same work ethic. They don't have the same core values. And so that creates a lot of personal growth opportunities mm -hmm. as well, right? For sure. Yeah. yeah, and something you said earlier that um, mm -hmm. you didn't want to get to know Diane in case you had to fire her because of you became <laughs> friends. It's more difficult. And sticking on the business partners, do you, do you think friends can be business partners? <laughs> I think it's, it's pretty... I think it's pretty difficult. I think nine out of 10 times, the answer would be no. I talk mm -hmm. people out of it. Hey, if you're friends or if you're married, con consider not. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it takes it takes two very intense personalities to be business partners. Uh, you have to know how to separate the business from the relationship. Um, there were times that we would bring our business mm -hmm. arguments home mm -hmm. and it didn't make for a good night's sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, now we have, you know, over 20 years, we've built rules where <laughs> for home, we're not talking about business. Mm -hmm. I might email her what's on my mind if I'm sitting on the couch watching television. But I, if I turn to her and now turn either date night or couch night, TV night into a business conversation, that's not going to benefit any of us. Um, but I don't think yeah. most people have the discipline and the structure mm -hmm. to maintain that. Yeah. 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 And, and I, I want to go back uh, even further. Um, Bedros, because um, to find out where your drive was to be an entrepreneur, and I've read the book and I, I probably have a, a good idea. Obviously, um, your father and your family came over from Armenia, so you guys were, were immigrants. Um, yes, Alan and I, that's one thing we've got in common, Alan and I also immigrants to the US, but the difference is we've been treated with a lot of respect and, and welcome, whereas back in the 80s when you and your father and your family came over, you weren't greeted with the same sort of respect. And so I think reading your book, your your sister was working and they weren't being treated well by their bosses. And you you came home and said, no, I'm, I'm going to change this. And so I'd love you to sort of uh, explain yeah. a bit more about that and your drive and passion to support yourself and support your family. I, I, I think hardship and trauma um, are always a good catalyst for someone doing something great, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you think of Viktor Frankl in his book, Right. As, as, he, as he went through um, these concentration camps and, and had these epiphanies and, and wrote such an amazing book. Um, and so being six years old when we came here to the United States and within that first year or two, so now seven, eight years old, my sister's got a job working at a pizzeria. The the owner of the place is very disrespectful with her. Um is always drinking out of her soda cup to make sure that it's water and not seven up or Sprite. And my sister would come home crying, um, telling my dad, I just, I can't tolerate this. I can't do this anymore. And my dad would say, just, we, we just need the money. You know, my dad had three jobs. My brother had a couple jobs. My sister had that job and was going to uh, um, junior college to learn the language better. And so when you're seven years old, you can't contribute financially. You can't go out and beat this guy up. You can't really, I, I felt, I, I remember the feeling of helplessness. And then I remember the feeling of, I, I have to do something about it. I have to be the one that does something about it. And so in my uh, attempt to, yeah, and, and, you know, as a kid, you don't think like, I go, I'm going to grow up and I'm going to be so rich, mm. sis, that you're never going to have to work again. That wasn't going to solve her problem in that moment, but it gave me some sense of I'm contributing. And so, um, I don't know, it's been like the last 10 years now, she's been working for us full time doing nothing. So, which is fantastic. Yeah. So we've retired my sister. She works for me doing nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then that, that was really my, my, my big catalyst to becoming an entrepreneur. Uh, and then of course, you know, when I had jobs, I just, I felt like, how can someone manage my time? How can they tell me my 15 minutes is up? I'm human. If it takes me a little longer to drink my coffee, 
please give me a moment. Like when I'm working, I'm working very efficiently, yeah. effectively. I'm not shooting this shit. I'm not wasting time. So I felt like I was being managed like a, a lesser human. Um, and I had like this creative ideas that I had at the workplace. I'm like, hey, what if we did this? So like, that's not how we do it. This is how we do it. So yeah. I felt very un un unemployable. I didn't feel like I was being respected as a human. And I think I'm very judicial. And so I have, um, I like to respect people and I expect to be respected back unless I've done something otherwise. Um, and so for that reason, and the, I, I, I knew entrepreneurship was my path, even if I had to work 10 times as hard mm -hmm. to barely make it by, I had to be my own boss. Yeah. I think that, that for us, I would definitely resonate with that a little bit more. I was exactly the same. I hated working for anybody. Mm -hmm. Any job that I got, I had to get into the management level as, as fast as possible. I think I was 14 when I started. I was 11 when I started working, but 14 when I started raising through through the ranks. And then when I met Dean, I was a bank manager, a number of properties. I was doing my own thing. Um, and Dean was injured kind of six months after we, we got together. So we had to, you know, he was out of the military. He had to find this new path. He had to learn everything about it. So... I had to switch from being that mindset to being he had to get out the front now and we had to make him into this this person that was doing it. And I think I found that really the most difficult. And I'd be quite interested to find out mm -hmm. from your mindset, from everything that I've, I've looked up about you, mm -hmm. you seem to have that same sort of flair, but you've managed to do it a little bit more behind the scene, I guess, would be the, yeah. the word. How does it? How is it for you? I think... From the start, like I've I've always just been good at a supporting role, like and it never felt really, I don't know, it just felt very natural, like the way our skill set lined up, like he was going to be the face of everything and that made sense. Um, and then at the same time, you know, we're having kids and I'm raising the kids and um, but but I did always need a creative outlet. And so I did, you know, go into recipe blogging and then got some cookbooks books published and um, was definitely needed my own outlet. And even today, like I'm in graduate school, I'm training to be a therapist. I'm like I have a path that I'm on that's very fulfilling, but I'm still fulfilling a supporting role in everything that we've built and everything that he's doing. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, I think it does because I think one thing that I, the mistake that I made was I went into the full supporting role. Mm -hmm. So I went completely, yeah. everything that I was doing kind of stopped mm -hmm. and then I was mom and then I was just doing these yeah. things. I think even to the point where we would run the business together and sometimes Alana Stott wouldn't get a reply. But if I would email as mm -hmm. Dean Stott, I would get the yeah. reply. So I yeah, became yeah. Dean Stott to an extent. And mm -hmm. it took a pressure on my mental health, I would yeah. say. And then when I started realizing that and we spoke about it and I said the same thing, I need this outlet yeah. for my own, things got a lot better. I think mm -hmm. you're right. There could be resentment if one is always succeeding the other one is not as you touched on down yeah. there fulfilling their um fulfill it fulfilling their path and so we we've seen that in the in the past is you're normally someone will sacrifice to the others but then they tend mm -hmm. to forget what their dreams were so where it seems to work is mm -hmm. when you are still able to fulfill your your dreams mm -hmm. you know whilst while supporting and I always believe you're only as good as your your support network um but mm -hmm. having having red man up and heard about um your your business partners I think Diana has always been the constant. She was always, always yeah. there. And, uh, and, and she will be. I can't think of a business decision that I that I would make that it wouldn't involve mm. Diana's mm. insight, wisdom, because she also has different skills mm. and ways of seeing things that I'm absolutely blind to. Mm. She will see around corners that I didn't even think about. Um, and maybe I'll be naive about something or I, I my ego won't allow me to see it or um, I'll have a blind spot to it because uh, there's one instance where a, a, a friend of mine was also a key member, a key role at our organization, but he was also very damaging to the organization. But I felt a sense of loyalty to him and kind of gave him extra slack. And the way Di approach me is very much like in a business sense, like here's 11 pages from me as in her and like five other team members that you trust and respect on how we feel 
was evidence about this person, making it irrefutable. The very next day, I shook his hand and said goodbye. Um, and so, you know, left up to me, it would have been a next another year probably in another year of damage to the mm -hmm. business, right? And had you just spoke about <clears throat> it before, did you ever? Yeah, but I think I've learned how to <laughs> yeah. approach these things with a higher success rate. But you know, what falls, I think, on the person more in the supporting role, the long-term support person is to have the really difficult conversations mm -hmm. and to, you know, say the things that maybe other people on the team see, but would never dare bring up. And so sometimes I'm like, man, I always have to be the one to ha do the hard things. But, you know, it, ultimately it's for his benefit and for the benefit of, of yeah. everything we're working on. Yeah. And, and, and to that point, you know, the sacrifices that Di made behind the scenes, like there were times where she literally had Andrew, our son, in one arm and typing up something for the business with the other hand. And so, you know, the fact that she was able to have her creative outlet with her recipe blog, her her books, and now her career into um, therapy, psychology, I, I feel like if she was like, hey, I want to be an astronaut, mm -hmm. the answer is yes. Who do we pay? What's the schooling? How do we structure it and make yeah. it happen? Because there was a partnership that was so uh, strong over so much time, 20 years, that produced such a great outcome for us mm -hmm. that I feel like forever indebted. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and we've been burned, just like every entrepreneur, you've been burned by people. And we have this little saying from day one, like, well, it's just you and me in the trench. Mm -hmm. Like we, we, we could, everybody could leave. It's just you and me, two soldiers in the trench. Yeah. We're going to dig ourselves out like we have in the past. And so to know that you've got someone that's not going to leave you, not going to betray you, um, going to help you work through the problems. Like I just need her. And I think you feel the same way about me. Uh, we can solve through any problem mm -hmm. together, which is a pretty, pretty cool thing to have. Like gives you restful sleep at night. And I think you're touching on something that kind of goes back to your previous question about being that supporting person. I think I've we've always looked at it as a team. Mm -hmm. And when you're working as a team, the wins are for the team. The team's winning, right? Yeah, he's up on the stage, but the team just won. Mm -hmm. And so I feel that I really participated and I participate in all of the success that maybe the world thinks is his success, but it feels like our team, mm -hmm. you know, our, it's our team's success, yeah. the two of us. Yeah, yeah no, I, I agree. Yeah, it's, it's the, the team is is the family and no one has, no, no one has the, your best interest than, than your wife. You know, mm -hmm. I, I relate so much to what Bedros was saying. I you know I've gone into business with guys and I, I come home and I tell Alana and she'll then, She'll challenge it, you know, she'll penetration test it. But what about this? I said, no, no, this guy can trust these guys. And and then, yeah, 18 months down the line, I come back home with my tail between my legs and said, yeah, you were right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think you have to learn from, uh, you have to learn from those experiences, you know, and you know, it's all about learning and then just not, not repeating them. Um, and so, but mm -hmm. yeah, the, the, the constant is always, always your wife. But, um, mm -hmm. but Bedros, I know, when you started work at 13 and then you, you, you then said you're not employable, but at that time in your life, you obviously worked for many managers, some good and some bad. Um, mm -hmm. I know from my time in the military, having instructors, there's those that stick with me for the right reasons. Those stick with me for the wrong reasons, but I learn from that. You know, I always say never expect of your staff or your students that you can't do yourself. And so what were the, the key things you learned during that, that phase before you then realize you're unemployable? Yeah, I, I learned a lot of great leadership lessons in that phase. And one of the biggest ones was a, uh, the job that I had for the longest period of time, Disneyland, six years. And I worked there and, you know, you, you look at Disneyland. I mean, that place runs off systems, processes, organization, et cetera. But at the end of the day, these are still humans running the processes. And so I worked on Main Street at a restaurant called Carnation Cafe and during the time that I worked there in the 90s, it was the uh, the Main Street Electrical Parade was the biggest thing ever. Mm -hmm. So we would have 80 to 100,000 guests in the park. And twice a night, Carnation Cafe became the busiest restaurant on the planet, mm -hmm. not just in the country, on the planet, like, like actual numbers, because everybody lined up on Main Street to watch the Electrical Parade. They would all come in because it was the only sit down restaurant uh, other than the Blue Bayou 
There's only two sit-down restaurants. Everything else is counter. Um, and so if you want to have a server, you want to have a sit-down meal, you're going to go to Carnation Cafe. And so it gets so busy. No one's the bus boys, the fry cooks, dinner cooks, sous chef. No one's taking time off the host, hostess, et cetera, uh, for breaks. And there was this there was this manager that I had. Her name is Kathy. Now, part of the process of the dinner cook is to every hour take take the thermometer. I, I had it here in my chef's outfit. Take the thermometer and take the temperature of all the food items and then chart it every hour so that if the health department comes in, we see that the potatoes are at this temperature and the heating, the warming oven is at this temperature and things, things are all numbered. Um, however, when you have a four hour rush to walk away from that um, kitchen to take temperatures, like your guys will literally find you in the hallway and beat the poop out of you, right? I mean, this tic the ticket machine is just out of control. Like one guy's job is just to put new thermal paper into the ticket machine during that time. It's nuts. It's nuts. I imagine like when you go to battle, if some guy's job is just to put more belt fed, you know, ammo into the machine gun. It was like that, right? Like this machine gunning yeah, of, yeah. of orders. And so could you imagine if I'm just taking suit temperatures and refrigerator temperatures, like these guys would beat me down, man. And so Kathy would come. And at the time, uh, Disney didn't allow facial hair, uh, but you can have sideburns. My, so my sideburns, one particular day were slightly below my earlobes and we're working and we're sweating and they were doing this, so the, it, the tickets everywhere. And I feel a, a pencil on the side of my face. <laughs> And I, and I look and I look and it's Kathy holding a pencil along the side of my earlobe to see if my sideburns are lower than that. And apparently they were a quarter inch lower. So she had me go across the street to the locker rooms and we had locker rooms to shave up my sideburns. Now, uh, was it my fault? Yes, I could have had shorter sideburns. Was that a great leadership decision? No, she absolutely killed morale mm. for the rest of the team there, which affected the guests and the experience that Walt Disney had set out, right? Um, so that's just one example. Another example would be if the temperatures during that two, three hour block were not, were not there. Now, what I would have done knowing about leadership now is, hey, we know when the electrical parade is. So let's hire an extra person to take temperatures of foods during the electrical parade. Your job is just to take temperatures because no one else can leave their stations. But that's not what happened. So she would come back, come in and raise hell again, destroy morale. And so we'd go, well, I'm taking my break. And so then there was Doug. Doug was this giant bellowing man. He had a Southern accent and he would come down. He had a big belly, probably six, four, and he would flip his tie over his shoulder and he would say, what can I help you with fellas? And well, well Doug, we need, we need someone on the dessert counter. I got this. And he would just, you know, put on an apron and, and start working the best he could in his dress shirt. And when, when the parade rush was over and we're, catching up, cleaning up, because we have two hours and the parade starts again the other way. Um, Doug was there cleaning with us. Mm -hmm. And so when you'd get a call on your day off and it's Doug telling you, can you work on Christmas morning? Because it's Christmas Eve. I've gotten that call. Doug, I'm there. Mm -hmm. When Kathy calls, I'm sorry. And you <laughs> yeah. hang up. And that was the difference between the Doug and the Kathy. And I realized one day when, I, when I'm a leader, I'm going to be more like Doug. And he, he gave me, one day I gave Doug an excuse because I was late to my workstation. And I said, Doug, I'm sorry, the, 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 the afternoon parade, it was like at the time, it was like the Lion King parade. The afternoon parade, I was stuck on the other side of it. He goes, Bedros, circumstance does not change responsibilities. Holy smokes, like that completely. And I think I have that quote in my book and I give credit to Doug because I realized a meteor can fall like it won't change my responsibilities for being here in the studio with you guys today. Uh, I, the only takeaways from Kathy are things that I should not do. Mm. The only takeaways from Doug is how to be an actual like wartime leader, like to lead from the front, to clean up afterwards, and then to give credit to the team as he always mm. did. It was just powerful. Yeah. Kathy, I hope you're listening. <laughs> in fact, in my book, the only two names I, I told the publisher, I refuse to change the two names because, you know, the publisher wants you to give them fictitious yeah. names. Uh, I, I said, look, I'll take the lawsuit if it comes, mm -hmm. but I'm going to leave Kathy's name and Doug's name in there. Doug deserves the credit and mm -hmm. Kathy needs to be highlighted. Yeah. 100%. Yeah, I think the thing I picked up from everything that we just said there, and that it was only just in that moment, 
Because I often say that I'm not the yes man. That's the, the, mm. the way me and Dean will have our conversations. I'm not the yes man. I'm the one who's going to tell you the truth, similar mm. to what you were saying. But I think you guys are not the yes men either. So mm. I think that's maybe why we're there's mm. a combination that's, that's working there. Because I know that you didn't receive medals and things because you wouldn't do the things that was involved kissing ass. You would rather actually get the job done. Yeah, I was. Ne- I was never. I always had long sidebends as well, Bedros. You know, it was <laughs> longer than it should have been. As yeah, my boots were never too. They were never shine like they should be. But on the mountain, you know, yeah, the best person to to be on the front line with. But I think, um, I think something there as well that resonated there is, and it, it might might be a common theme. It might not. Is that you know, I've I've worked. My first job was in Burger King. You know, on the on the shop floor, cleaning up on on the shop floor. And I think you have to start on the front line you have to be interactive with people be able alana you doing your tele sales being able to to communicate and then work your way up you know there's a uh, i know there's some companies that you can't just come in at director level you have to start at the bottom and you can only work your way up and i think i mean that's why i got from from your book is that you'd been there on the front line at, at, the, at the um on the shop floor in the in the cafe as well working and then you worked your way up and then learned those managerial skills and then took that took that forward. But I think there's mm-hmm. a common theme that I'm seeing in successful businesses is that mm-hmm. when you speak to the people, they, they didn't start there. They started down and they know every role within their organization. And right. another thing I picked up um, is um, the alien abduction. Yeah. Came up with. <laughs> yes, the alien abduction manual. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you want me to go into that? Okay. Yeah, please. Yeah, that's yeah. really good. Yeah. So the alien abduction manual, one day I realized as we were probably getting to, I don't know, five, six, seven employees that uh, me and Diana realized like, hey, not everyone is as motivated like we are. Not everyone is going to stay around here like we are. Like Diana might have information in her head, but I know she's going to be around and she knows I'm going to be around. So a lot of that information is called tribal knowledge. Um, we don't necessarily need to document what I do, but even then at the point where our companies are, everything is documented. But we realized some of our team members, we don't even know the passwords to the websites that they've created, like the web developer. And we don't, we don't know exactly how they onboard a new franchise location. And so I was talking to Joan and uh, Joan was my first employee that I did not resent and that I felt like actually had our back. Mm -hmm. And so I was so afraid of losing her. I said, Joan, do you think, um, do you think maybe you can just get a three ring binder and document everything? Like how you pick up the phone, what you say, what times you answer the emails, uh, the answers to all the emails, like, you know, create a document of all the different questions you get via emails from our customers. She goes, how come? I said, I don't want to tell her in case you quit or in case I ever fire you. So I said, you know, if you ever get abducted by an alien, <laughs> if, if a spacecraft comes and you get abducted by an alien and, and poof, you're gone, I want to be able to take this and give it to someone that yeah. can do your job at 70, 80, 90% capacity. And that led to creating our alien abduction manual. And today those are on you know Google Docs and we have a whole process oh. for it and a, a learning center for it, et cetera. But that was the... I hope Joan has copyrighted that. Yeah, yeah, you would think. You would think. Because I'm going to fire her when we get home. No, I'm kidding. I'm going to know. She's been with us for almost a decade. Joan's, yeah, she's like family to us. But um, without that, you have this massive insecurity. The bigger your company gets, you have this massive insecurity like, oh, my gosh, Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know how to log into any of our Mm -hmm. QuickBooks, Mm -hmm. you know. Um, And and if, if Connie is all of a sudden abducted by an alien, our accountant, I wouldn't know what to do. I don't know if you have access to that. Do. You, you do, but <laughs> yeah. right. And so there, there's things that our sale, our, our franchise sales process has completely changed since I was doing that. Mm-hmm. But I know that there's a Google doc with the current structure, the current process in place that God forbid we lose Max, our head franchise guy, I could step in or Bryce mm-hmm. could step in. And that gives me peace of mind when I'm out here doing this on stage mm-hmm. speaking or at night sleeping. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which I think that comes, yeah, yeah. Or I was just going to say like, that comes from the fact that like, w- there was that one point where we were the whole company, we were, like, yeah. so many, like yeah. we were everything. So we knew everything. And so then as you let go and let go and let go of more things, just needing that, that security yeah. of like, okay. And that definitely seems to be the hardest. Anybody I speak to, that's mm-hmm. the hardest moment yeah. is that the delegation, the letting mm-hmm. go. 
something I'm still terrible at. And Dean, yeah. well, Dean delegates to me easy enough. But yeah. <laughs> it's your baby, right? I mean, yeah. it's like you, you gave birth to this mm -hmm. and, and you know all the intricacies and you know what happens if a phone call's missed. And mm -hmm. You, you just can't, what if I don't want to go back to eating Subway sandwiches again? You know, like I, I know what what failure will look like. It's when I mean, we were stealing our With neighbors coupons. coupons from their driveway <laughs> so we can get two sandwiches for the price of one. We were that broke. I don't want to ever go back to that. Yeah. And so the fear of delegating to someone is real. But then when you find the right people, you realize, holy smokes, like they're no longer employees. Now we have team members and the entire team knows the mission and the mission is to win. Mm -hmm. And I love that mindset that we have at HQ. And did you find as, we, I mean, we spoke about the business partners that couldn't be trusted, but was there people that were involved that y you did trust and you did love and you did welcome in and they betrayed you? Did you have that? Many, many, many times. <laughs> you, want to, you want to tell a Shannon story? <laughs> no, you tell that story better. Yeah, well, <laughs> so w one person was at the beginning of our at Fit Body Boot Camps, launch. So we started Fit Body Bootcamp 2010 as a licensing program. By 2012, we became a franchise. When did this take place? 2013, maybe 2014? 2013, 2014. Yeah, 2013, we had maybe, I don't know, 80, 90 franchise locations of our Fit Body Bootcamp gyms. And our head of operations, now we probably had a total of five, six employees in, in the building. It's, it wasn't that building that you guys came to. We were renting a little sweatshop somewhere in Chino Hills. And our head of operations, Shannon, um, and, and this is bad leadership on my part, and I talk about this in my book. I was such a poor leader in terms of I was passive aggressive. I expected her to at times to read my mind, which is impossible. Uh, I realize that now. But I also hired someone did not have the, she did not have the core values that we did, the work ethic that we did, and she felt threatened when we brought Joan in because Joan now was trying to do her job well. So she was questioning everything. Why do we do things that way? How come there's no alien abduction manual for her? What we should create one for, for that person. And so one day I, I think I went to lunch with you and the kids or something. And I, and I came back from lunch and I noticed that Shannon's not at her desk. Her desk has been cleaned up. And in the back of my mind, I'm like, good riddance. She just got up and left. Thank God. You know, like I, Wanted to fire her at some point, but you kind of also feel held hostage by, because she does do some decent work at times. Well, within minutes, I start smelling something. And it's, I see two trash bags in the corner there, and it smells something like coffee and chemicals. I open the trash bags and all of our franchise sales contracts, I'm talking the people's credit card information, mm -hmm. driver's license, addresses, everything. She poured, dumped, took them, took them out of the files. Everything's digital now, right? But mm -hmm. back then, out of the files. That, exactly, that look <laughs> is what I, and she put it into trash bags and mm -hmm. she put coffee and, you know, in, in the bathroom, we had carpet cleaning solution. She poured mm -hmm. and shook it all up, tied a knot. And Diana and Joan and Joan's sister had to come and peel. We like spread them out across the floor. We're trying to dry them. Air We're dry trying them. to like, you know, transfer whatever exactly. information was left. Yeah. I mean, talk about talk about trusting someone and then having that backfire, yeah. right? Um, but also. And do you know why she done it? Part of it was, I, I believe I was a poor leader at the time in terms of setting expectations and, and communicating my needs and wants. And so then I would be snappy with her and she probably didn't like that. I wouldn't like that. Uh, the other part of it was, I do know that she felt threatened. We later heard from a lot of, a few of those team members that um, she felt threatened when Joan came in and had a feeling that Joan might be taking over her role. And so felt like, there is no alternative. Joan is going to take over. So I need to leave in a hurrah. And she did. We also found a lot of holes in her work. Yes. Once she was gone and we did like audits, then mm -hmm. it was like, oh, wow. Okay. There was a lot of things falling through yeah. the cracks. There was so. franchise agreements that weren't, mm -hmm. we had taken the initial mm -hmm. buy-in fee, yeah. but no one was charging them their monthly yeah, it fees. Was, it, was, it was a mess. So she was literally, um, I guess, slowing down the growth of our company. Yeah. There was a lot So of that. that we don't hire more people. So you look wow. at the money, well, there's no money in the bank account. I can't hire more people, even though I need them. Wow. Turns out that we probably had 15, 20,000 a month yeah. in revenue that should have been coming in. Yeah. It's, it's interesting how hiring the wrong person can do so much damage to your business. And then being a shitty leader can do so much damage yeah. to a business. Somewhere in the balance there is uh, the right team member 
and a leader who can communicate, express their vision, maintain emotional discipline, and then lead from the front. I think the one thing we've found is definitely the ones that, that we've come across. Um, you know, let's say Dean's doing something amazing, breaking world records, whatever he's doing. Rather than trying to achieve greatness, they would rather pull yes. him down mm-hmm. yes. closer at their level. And it's something I'd be interested because <laughs> of the PhD I hear you're, you're, you're doing. Well, is that helped you understand those people a little bit more? I, I need to take a step back. I'm, I'm getting my master's right now. So okay. <laughs> PhD will be later. I cannot, I cannot take credit for that yet. Um, but yeah, definitely. I mean, there's a lot of different ego defenses that we, that we utilize. Um, and I think you know, the business setting is very interesting for all of these ego defenses to kind of be um, amplified. Um, And, you know, it's funny because like Shannon was one example from 10 years ago, but there's been, there's been many more. And it's like, you learn something as leaders, as humans with each subsequent relationship that kind of goes south in that way. But I just, I do think that the business setting and especially the business setting that we have, which is very high paced, it's very like high pressure. Um, I think it, it kind of, it amplifies these, these characteristics and these different things. But I think a lot of it comes out of, um, you know, people's survival and people's wanting to protect their ego yeah. is my opinion. And do you feel people like you said there has been quite a few? Mm. Do you, I mean, often we'll say, do we attract these people? Oh my like gosh, this? we say that too. We have said that so many times. Like, is are we the problem? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I have figured out though why that is. Okay. You guys are high speed. We're high speed. From the outside, when you watch high speed people, it is beautiful. Yeah. It's symphony. It's mm. art. It's they're going somewhere and mm. and everybody wants to be part of that thing. Um, that Michael Jordan movie we just watched, mm-hmm. uh, the Nike movie where they just created the Michael Jordan shoes. Oh, the air, I haven't seen yeah. It. yeah. Good movie. Um, Matt Damon is telling Michael Jordan in, in, in the movie, mm. he says, look, young man, like you are greatness. When you step into those shoes, you're going to be greatness. The rest of us, we're going to be forgotten. You're going to be remembered forever. Mm-hmm. And all we can do as a shoe company, as a guy that made the shoes, a guy that markets the shoes, a guy that's trying to get you to sign this contract <laughs> is I could have just be part of greatness but you are greatness. I could be around greatness while I'm alive, but you are greatness. And so I call it the speeding train. When people see our companies, our businesses, the things we're doing, it's like, man, I want to be on the speeding train. Everyone seems to be having fun. It's really awesome. It's really great. You get on the speeding train and it's a pressure cooker. Mm, it, is. it is a pressure cooker. Like expectations are high. Mm. I am unreasonable in terms of how I manage and how what my expectations are. And the reason I'm unreasonable in my expectations these days. And I'm very clear about it when they're getting hired. Well, the team hires them now, but they're very clear. They go, look, you're about to work for a crazy man and he's unreasonable <laughs> in his expectations. And the reason for that is, is because uh, it, it's a personal development company. Yeah. We, we go, surprise, you're not just working for a franchise or a supplement company or a coaching business. You're about to experience the highest level of personal development because what we're going to ask of you, your parents have not asked of you, your grandparents have not asked of you, your school teachers have not asked of you in case, in, in case, in fact, they were afraid of what you're capable of. So they mm. declaw you, defang you, neuter you, want you to fall into the box. I know that there's a fighter jet within you. Yeah. They took the fighter jet. They made it into a crop duster. I'm going to expect fighter jet outcomes from you it's again they go man i can't wait i follow you on social media i've read your book i watch your videos i'm on board but then they begin to have that battle as diana said with the identity of who mom and dad raised them as and who we're expecting them to become and that chasm creates a fallout or an opportunity of launch yeah and people grow at their own rate and i think it, it can be frustrating I think in our position sometimes to want people to grow faster and want them to develop faster, but we all have this internal resistance that we battle. Mm. And because the train is going so fast, that it's the capacity to keep up and the capacity to want to keep pushing in mm. self-development because you have to keep pushing your self-development yeah. to stay with us because we're developing. We're not done. Like yeah. we're still at the beginning of our started. self-development. Yeah. And so the gap widens and maybe they keep up for a while and maybe yeah. it's, 
it's exciting for a while, but to really kick it into like endurance mode where it's like, mm -hmm. Hey, this is the long haul. It's most, most people don't have that capacity. And I don't think it's, it's any fault of ours because then you find those right people who do have the capacity and it's yeah. a beautiful thing. Equally as crazy, equally yeah. as driven. <laughs> and you're like, th these are my people. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was a frustration at ours is why are they not working at our speed? Why are they not, mm -hmm. you know, why are they emailing me straight away? Like it's that you're probably on a high speed train and they're on the Orient Express and they're comfortable. <laughs> right. The Orient Express. Well said. Yeah, but they don't want to jump on your train. But mm -hmm. the, you, know, you talk, you do a lot on high performance teams. I speak a lot on high performance teams and, you know, I talk about the, the synergies between special forces, sports teams and, and business and on, entrepreneurs. Uh, no, in the, in the special forces, we have a selection process for our teams, and that's done before they even come to us. You know, and that's really to highlight the resilience of the individuals, and ensure that they have the core values and everything they need. Your team now, obviously, you've talked about teams that you had in the past. Um, have you? How do you select your team now? Do you do you have core values? Do you get involved in the the recruitment, or do you leave that to someone else now? What? What have you learned from your, your time in the past with uh, previous employees? Yeah, well, th these days we follow a process from uh, the book Traction. Gino Wickman wrote a great book called Traction. In the book, he talks about EOS, Entrepreneurial Operating System. And, um, you know, they, he stresses that everything is about the core values. And the core values start with the founders, the visionaries, and they go down. And the words that our EOS implementer uses. He says, you have to reek of your core values. They can't just be aspirational. Uh, like, hey, yay, everybody have a fun day. Like for me, a fun day is intense, high pressure. Like this is a fun day for me. I, I want to do this. And then I got a thing. I got a sales call after this. And then I got a thing, had a thing before this. And I have another thing until late tonight. Like that's a fun day for me. But people go, when do you take time off? Like, I don't. And yeah. if I do, I'm on an airplane and I'm reading a book, but that's serving me in a way as well. But the way we hire now is using EOS is our core values. So it's drive change, exceed expectations and be relentlessly disciplined. Those are and when you look at me and Diana, you will absolutely see those three things. And then it now has to bleed into our team. We had like eight or nine or 10 core values. And whenever I challenge big companies, but tell me your core values. And I start writing it down on the marker board. They get to four or five, six, and they can't tell me the rest. Mm. That's because they don't even live it. Those are aspirational. Mm -hmm. Like they want to have fun. They want to deliver good service. They want to have you know, forward thinking. But what the fuck does that mean? Right? And and so we boiled out ours down to the three things that we are. We want to always drive change, um, uh, exceed expectations, and then be relentlessly disciplined. And so we hire by that. Uh, goes through HR, department head, and then depending on how high level that role is, I may end up meeting with them. Or if it's something that's in Diana's lane, where management of our money, et cetera, then Di will end up meeting with them. If it's just at the departmental level, then it goes through two processes, department head and uh, HR. But they're still interviewing based on the core values.